Hello and welcome to London 360, the only regular news feature show that keeps you up to date with everything that's going on in the capital. You can catch us here weekly or you can watch the show anytime and get involved online at communitychannel.org forward slash London 360. Stay tuned for our exciting lineup to uncover the grand designs of Open House London and to find out who was cooking up a storm for the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. First up, imagine watching a concert through a pinhole. That's what the audience at the Sound for Sight event did to recreate what it's like for over two million people living with sight loss in the UK. Jordan Shelley headed to the Tabernacle to discover how the experience was eye-opening for the audience and performers. I'm at the Sound for Sight event as part of World Sight Day, a unique fundraising gala held to raise awareness of the importance of music to the partially sighted and blind. With performances from a range of different live music acts, the audience will get a chance to see what it's like living with a sight condition by wearing these sight loss simulators during the performance. I created Sound for Sight last year when a good friend of mine, Yvette Shivers, um, told me that she'd been diagnosed with a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. The condition means that she's gradually losing her eyesight throughout her lifetime. And so when I heard this news, I decided that I wanted to try and help raise awareness for my friend's condition, but also for the condition that two million people have. The importance is raising awareness for sight loss conditions in general. RNIB are our main charity, and RNIB do a fantastic job looking after people that are losing their sight. When you're blind, your, your other senses is like really heightened and um, you might see or feel the things that are different to other people. So it's just like for other people to feel that. I've, I've had people, you know, family, friends who have nearly lost their sight and it's a horrible thing to go through, you know. I mean, playing music is really the only thing I'm good at, so if I can help out while doing so, that's amazing. I have comfort in knowing where my fingers land, and it really was hard. In the end, I actually felt it was a great experience. I was able to connect more with the song. It's always more powerful to let the audience experience what the charity is about in, in a little way. Through the years of being involved in various different charities, a lot of the time you'll end up meeting some of the people that are in the charities at Adolf. And the inspiration that comes from them, it kind of makes you feel so silly. Because sometimes we all stress about things that really, when you put it into perspective, are just nothing, you know. When I was growing up, uh, I actually wanted to be a tennis player. The idea was to play on the centre court at Wimbledon at some point. But as I started losing my sight gradually, not only that changed, but everything in my life changed. So uh, it has been a process of readjusting and relearning everything that I knew as a sighted person to uh, different stages of sight loss. How did you find wearing the sight loss simulator this evening? It just makes you think how a low vision sight, you know, these people are. The um, sight loss simulators were a real eye opener. Um, I work with special needs children um, with visual impairments, so it's quite interesting to listen to the music with that sort of experience of what they might actually be seeing. All you had was literally the music, everything else was cancelled out. I think everyone should wear this at concerts. For one weekend each year, Open House opens its doors to the public, granting them access to some of London's finest examples of building design and architecture. From the Victorian era to the modern day, my report showcases three of the hidden gems in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Open House London is the capital's largest annual festival of architecture and design. It offers visitors access to over 700 buildings for free, from 18th century Victorian houses to cutting edge modern builds. I live in West Kensington and so I wanted to see some places around 
the neighborhoods I don't want to go too far or go to too touristy places. So I picked up a few interesting houses and that's how I ended up here. So 18 Stafford Terrace is the home and workplace of Edward Lindy Sanborn, who was a cartoonist on Punch magazine and also a freelance book illustrator. One of the unique features of this house are the stained glass windows. The Sanborns had an amazing collection of oriental ceramics which are to be seen displayed throughout the house. This period is what we call the age of China mania where if you could afford this stuff you got your hands on as much of it as you could find. It doesn't seem right to throw away the past. It seems right that we should try to preserve what we have so that people can see in the future how people lived. Situated within walking distance of Stafford Terrace, Leighton House was the home and studio of Frederick Lord Leighton, a leading Victorian painter and the former president of the Royal Academy of Arts. The Arab Hall forms the centrepiece of the house. Based on the Palace of Laziza at Palermo in Sicily, the Arab Hall contains tiles from Damascus in Syria, coloured glass windows again from Damascus, and Byzantine-style gold mosaic around the wall. So the studio is the heart of the house. The walls are painted picture gallery red, which was Leighton's and many artists' favourite colour for displaying their work against. For a lot of people, art is a bit of a mystery to them. They don't know what's going on behind. They just see the, the finished pieces. So when they can come out and see the methodology, the process broken down, people get very excited and very interested, and they start to open up about their feelings about art. I really admire the beautiful rooms and the different kind of styles in each of the rooms. It's so surprising as well that there's a house like this just hidden in like, the middle of London. Hidden House is a modern family home build that has been transformed from a derelict muse into a 21st century masterpiece. I just said that everybody could have their, their desert island item and they could write it on a piece of paper and I would build it and Claire wanted to dance floor. Luckily, Gil wanted a DJ booth, so that was sorted. We've been doing Open House since 2001. We've done this house for four years. People don't have a lot of opportunity to go into houses, modern houses. They don't have many opportunities to actually see what fantastic places they are to live. People of all ages come, I particularly like getting young people, even pre-university, children who might be thinking about getting into architecture. When we got here today, the queue was you know, it's half a mile long and it's you know, very, very impressive. It's just the opportunity to see what other people have done with the space that they've found and just to see what they started with and what they've actually turned it into, and it's absolutely amazing. Open House Weekend returns next year in September. To find out more about the houses that are open to the public throughout the year, visit the Open House website and follow them on social media at Open House London. Here at London 360, we love to give people a platform to have a say about their great city. So we invite you to send us your stories, points of view, or even passionate rants. Harry Francis from Belvedere went to Lesness Abbey to discover how Bexley Council is improving local green spaces. Hello, I'm Harry Francis and I'm at Lesness Abbey Ruins in the London Borough of Bexley, which is in the midst of a £3.5 million development project with funds from the Heritage Lottery Fund and Big Lottery Fund, which they acquired in January 2014. The building of the new Leslie's Lodge is now underway, with it set to provide classrooms, offices and refreshments for the staff and public upon its completion. The surrounding area, after the completion of the lodge, is set to have a rework of the Monk Garden, as well as a dipping platform and a recreational park, which is set to provide a pump bicycle track, an outdoor gym, a parkour park and table tennis for the local community. But whilst enhancements are being made to this green site in the borough, Bexley Council will be holding a meeting to propose redevelopments of four other green sites in the borough as they seek to save £37 million. But watch this space as the project's due to be complete for next summer. That's all for part one. But see you after the break for more London stories. We'll be finding out about an unusual church service dedicated to pets and why hundreds of young people were staying late at the Tate.
Welcome back to part two of London 360, the only show that unearths real stories from London's hidden communities. Late at Tate is back with another series of free events that aim to inspire young people to experiment and innovate through art and performance. Farhat Saidi soaked up the creative energy that was on display at Tate Britain. Where I think I would be with uh, a programme like this is I will still be trying to find something to do. We're here at Tate Britain, where Late at Tate has returned. This event has been put together by young people for young people. With around 700,000 young people in unemployment, is there enough opportunities for them and have we seen an improvement? It's a large scale event, it's been a long standing part of Tate's culture, but it's just become entirely peer led, so it's become entirely curated, produced by young people for young people. Later Tate started many, many moons ago at Tate. Um, and it's been taken over by the circuit programme. So the circuit programme enables young people to be producing their own culture within organisations. And Later Tate is a large scale festival. We've got music, we've got performance, installation, interactive workshops. And the idea is that we use Later Tate as a platform to bring in new audiences and showcase Tate's collection to a new audience and young people. Like not a lot of youth these days have the opportunity to even have these events going on. We're still young ourselves, so seeing other people, young people that are passionate about creating an event like this is very powerful. It's a beautiful thing still because I think the youth of tomorrow need to be involved and lead their own way and encourage other young people their age to come Solid together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, inspiring. it's very inspiring. Yeah. What is the scene in London for young teenagers, young adults such as yourselves? There isn't actually that much. I mean, like, you can go to gigs, so it's really good that the Tate are doing things like this to sort of bring young people to the forefront, but especially in a time like this where I think a lot of young people feel really downtrodden and, like, let down, feel like they don't, they can't do anything, so it's really nice because it's not very common. So I would say that there's enough opportunities, but what it is is that there is no communication. So, like, there's young people trying to find something to do, and there's, there's organisations that provide a platform for the young people, but the gap is, like, there's no bridge. There's no bridge. The young people know what young people want. So if we're not listening to them, then we're kind of constantly just feeding a demographic that we're kind of always a bit like, oh, we really secured that. Do you know what I mean? I feel like, I, don't, I remember being, I'm still a young person, but I remember being younger than a young person and I'm wanting experiences and opportunities like this. Some young people out there that are hungry and you know, they're, they're, they're driven to want to do great things in life, but they're not being heard or not have the opportunity or they're not on the right platform. You know, we're speaking, but we're not raising our voice loud. So I guess that's what we need to do. Just let them know, like, okay, we're here. All those, you know, stereotypes of, you know, like, that's not me. Don't put a label on me. You know what I mean? I'm here to achieve something. So just help me achieve it. Don't, you know, drive me away. There's kind of really exciting projects coming out of peer-led and community-led and kind of co-design practice that I think can really benefit us all. London, you know, is a highly diverse, you know, city, vibrant city, and the events that happen here, this is the nation's collection, it belongs to the people, should reflect that. The bond between pet and owner is often a special one. So what better way to honour this relationship than a unique Thanksgiving service for pets held at St Martin's Church in North West London. Rishi Pasord chased the tale. I've been involved with the Blessing Service for the past 16 years. I worked originally at the Mayhew Animal Home and we ran the service there. When I left the Mayhew, the vicar was rather keen that the service should continue. So after having some discussion, we decided to restart it about six years ago and it's been running again ever since. My mum's friend mentioned it to us and they said that they had a cat before which wasn't blessed and he died earlier than the one that was so we just thought that it would be good luck. It's been great having all the dogs here in the church it's like amazing and she lost her puppies um, a month ago it was really sad so we did a, we did a blessing she's this is violin so we did a blessing for her. As Christians we believe that Jesus came to redeem the whole of creation it's a recognition of God as creator 
and that animals, creatures are part of that creation. The blessing part for me, in terms of being a priest, that's just a real privilege uh, to be able to do that, to share God's blessing in that way. This year we had a we had a lizard and we had a, a stick, do we have a stick insect? And we had a locust which was going to be eaten by the lizard, which didn't get eaten by the lizard actually, so that was good. We came I think about four years ago first of all because our cat passed away and so we brought a photograph and it was just so touching. Can you just tell us a little bit more about your relationship with your, your own pet? Um, he, he's very independent. He's a bit like me. He reflects me very much. They say that dogs become like you. But I did have a marvellous compliment. I was walking the dog on Wormwood Scrubs and a woman came up to me and said, your dog's good looking and you're good looking. <laughs> and I said, thank you. Both my dogs work in film and television work and we're actually work, working in the West End on the play at the moment. So a very, very close relationship with them. Did you tell us which play? Yeah, it's called Yumi Bum Bum Train. James spoke of his reasons behind setting up such an initiative for both pet and owner and why it was important for him to do so. There is an issue about the morality of how we relate to animals and I felt that people with strong religious convictions, if one could persuade them or encourage them to consider their relationship with animals as being a, a moral issue, then it would enhance further the welfare of animals. And I work particularly with people who live with HIV and as they came towards the end of their lives, it was amazing we used to take animals in for them to stroke and even if their lives maybe ended in say 24 hours or 48 hours, they still were able to stroke an animal and still have a connection with life. I think creatures do offer this solace to people. People today, you know, travelled from quite far and quite widely around London, partly because there aren't many of these services around. Pets are so important, especially if you're old or you don't get out much, they become a real central part of your life. The people who come and attend a service like this, their awareness of the importance of animals in their lives is heightened by it. So I think it will encourage people to be more responsible pet owners. <laughs> Following on from our previous feature on the Royal National Lifeboat Institute, Farhat Saidi visited the Tower Lifeboat Station on the embankment to find out why chef and restaurateur Mark Hicks was cooking a special white bait feast for the crew. We, we so often sit down for supper and have our, have our meal uh, disturbed by uh, the bell going and finding that there's somebody in the water. Um, and uh, it's our job and, and, our, and our real um, privilege to go out uh, and to help those people. And it would be wonderful if people could support us by holding a fish supper with their friends um, and, uh, and raise money to help us continue to do that. I'm here at the Tower Lifeboat Station in London for the launch of the RNLI Fish Supper Weekend. This is where celebrity chef Mark Hicks will be cooking a full course meal for the crew members of this station. It's part of a awareness raising to raise money for the RNLI um, and also to highlight the fact that around the coast like so many people um, who give their time to the RNLI have their family dinners interrupted um, on a regular basis to go out and save lives. The evening was inspired by the white bait suppers that used to be popular 200 years ago. People ranging from cabinet ministers to Charles Dickens would attend these suppers in secret to discuss important matters such as politics. Tonight's supper is uh, in celebration of the old-fashioned Thames white bait suppers, which used to go on, you know, back in the 1800s really, when there was plenty of fish actually all the way up the Thames, and some of the fish would have been fairly small fish, not big stuff, so things like white bait, and a lot of ministers and politicians would attend these white bait suppers. Sadly, they sort of died out really, with, I suppose, industry fish stopped coming up the Thames, and the white bait suppers, I suppose, really, they sort of just died out. Whilst experiencing the white bait supper being prepared, there was never a dull moment, as the life crew members received a call and were out to save a life within a matter of seconds. First in the water. Okay. 
today we were called to a, a gentleman who'd um, found himself in the water. He was obviously very distressed, very shocked. He'd, he'd clearly hurt his ankle. We brought him back to the lifeboat station. The ambulance crew uh, met us and we're, we're quite used to working with the other emergency services to get people off to the right place. It doesn't happen today, but I think it's a good thing to do. Dinners like this in memory, those old white bait suppers. I think there's a, there's a really important thing about being aware that um, the RNLI is here and we want to raise that awareness. Um, so we really encourage everyone to, to have a fish supper this weekend, invite your friends and family over um, and get them to donate or sponsor you for doing a fish supper um, and think about the crews around the country who are quite often called out and have their meals disrupted, have their family lives disrupted, um, but help to donate so that we can continue to do that work and, and save lives on the sea. So that's it for this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed the show. To find out more information about any of the stories featured or to send in any suggestions you may have for future episodes, head to communitychannel.org forward slash London360. If you'd like to stay up to date with what goes on behind the scenes here, be sure to join in the conversation and follow us on Twitter at London underscore 360. And remember, keep it 360.